The Supra may well be a super car, but it's not a super car. Sure, it goes like one, and if you're far enough away, it even looks like one, but it just isn't special enough. Now, the Honda NSX, on the other hand, is special enough, but in my book, it's too easy to drive to be a supercar. However, this is not my book. It's not a book at all, in fact. It's a video, and it's yours. So here goes. Talk of supercars, and you think excitement and impracticality. The ultimate in performance, but nowhere to stow your golf clubs. Great style and drama but an unwilling thoroughbred fighting to wrest control from the macho male behind the wheel. When the Japanese talk of supercars, it comes out differently. The NSX looks okay and performs brilliantly, but maybe the engineers have done too good a job and designed out the character one associates with a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Maybe it's too much like a Porsche. That's not a 911 but a 944. Driving the NSX on the open road really is a very simple task. Honda wanted the car to be easy to drive, and suddenly they've succeeded in doing that. All the controls are very standard, normal controls. Gear change, clutch, braking, it's all very light indeed. The engine has very good torque, which gives it great pulling power, so the second gear will take you from 0 to 90 miles an hour. In fact, it's too tall, so in some of these tight turns, you need to drop down into first if you're hoping to enjoy some sporting performance. Really, it's rather too well house-trained for the public roads. After all, any supercar finds speed limits and narrow lanes hard to take. So the empty circuit at Alton Park was a welcome release. In creating their ultimate supercar, Honda have chosen a mid-engine layout with a 3-litre V6 engine mounted right behind the driver's seat. They've actually chosen not to go the turbocharged route, but instead the engine has all the very latest in high-tech engine design. There's variable timing, variable volume induction, and a sequential port fuel injection system. All this adding up to give the driver up to 274 horsepower as a maximum to play with. At the same time, they've tried to make the car as light as possible to make the very most out of this power that's available. They've created an aluminium monocoque, aluminium body panels, and aluminium suspension. All this to keep the weight down as much as possible. Even so, this package, when compared with its major competitors, is still heavier than Porsche's 911 Carrera 2 and doesn't have as good a power-to-weight ratio as Ferrari's 348. The interior is very road car basic. It's a very simple layout. and There's nothing futuristic in the instrumentation of this supercar. Space-wise, well, there's plenty of room for the driver and the passenger, but there's no room at all for my briefcase and no little parcel shelf for any knickknacks. Elsewhere, there's precious little space also. Under the bonnet, there's only room for the radiator, the anti-lock braking system, and the space saver wheel, which needs to be inflated before you can use it. In the middle of the car, well, there's the engine, and that takes up all that space. While around at the rear, there is a small boot, just enough room for my luggage, but if I have to put the punctured wheel in, it just about squeezes in there. The racetrack is the proper place to play with all this power, but it also demonstrates the VTEC variable timing system is really wasted on the public roads. It comes in at 6,000 revs, which is 60 miles an hour in second, but a highly illegal 90 in third. Having said that, it really is a beautiful engine to drive. With a rev limit just over 8,000 revs, there is a singing power from 6,000 all the way through. The braking is very, very good indeed. That uh, four-pot, four-wheel ABS anti-locking working very well. But also the traction control system is very good indeed, only occasionally interrupting my power acceleration. Handling again, also very, very sure-footed. Mild understeer turning in, 
but hardly a twitch of the tail as full power is added. So really a, a smooth, high speed driving is almost a faultless car. Of course, on a racetrack you can try a little harder, and for preference I would switch off the traction control system so I could slide the tail a bit more through the slower corners. Mild understeer, then I can put the power in, and then there's just a little wag of the tail as the rear wheel breaks its traction. Hard acceleration, third gear, 7,000. Third gear taking me to about 110 miles an hour before I need fourth gear. Back on the public roads, and straight away the supercar turns back into a saloon car. It really is a very, very easy car to drive. Everything is light, the controls easily come to hand. Now that was one of Honda's design criteria. They wanted to make a supercar that almost anybody could just get into and drive. And in that they succeeded. It's as easy to drive as a Porsche's 944S2. But then it does have all the impracticalities and lack of space of Ferrari's 348. So in a way, they've got either the best or the worst of both worlds. And it really depends what you're looking for when you're trying to buy a supercar.